try and find a way so that voices are heard in this House when they need to be. But I thank you, I thank you for your rule this morning. <clears throat> we'll now take a 40-second recess until the start of question period. Questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, over the summer we all learned of a New Glasgow woman who was desperate to get her son the mental health services that he needed. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to access services and he was advised by this woman, uh, by the police, and I'll quote from her story, she was told by a police officer that maybe the only way to get her son the medical treatment he needed was to have him arrested because then he would be in the court system and sent to Dartmouth for a 30-day mental health assessment. Mr. Speaker, this is one story of many that are becoming all too familiar to Nova Scotians. I'd like to ask the Premier if he believes this is acceptable in the province of Nova Scotia. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I don't uh, believe any Nova Scotian would believe that uh, it's acceptable that the only way that young people in this uh, province can receive the medical care they require is to uh, become part of the justice system. That's why uh, we continue to uh, try to invest in adolescent mental health. That's why we've been investing uh, in, in our education system for early identification of uh, uh, onset of uh, uh, mental health issues early in a young person's life. Uh, we know as a government, I think all Nova Scotians know, we need to continue to do more uh, uh, to provide the supports uh, to uh, families that, that, like the Honourable Member just mentioned here, uh, I want to tell him as well, I, I, I raised it when I was in Ottawa with the Prime Minister, that I believe this is an opportunity for us as a nation uh, to put together a, 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 an aggressive uh, uh, approach to adolescent mental health uh, to ensure that not only young uh, Nova Scotians, young Canadians uh, receive the support they need uh, as quickly as possible. Mr. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I am pleased to hear that the pre uh, Premier raised adolescent me mental health during his meetings in Ottawa earlier this week because this story, Mr. Speaker, and so many like it, uh, we hear more and more of them every day and I completely agree we need to do more for families like this mother and her young son as in fact Mr. Speaker sadly he did end up getting arrested on an assault charge and now that mother says that he might end up with a criminal record well I'm sure everyone in this house agrees we do not want to see young people with mental illness deserving of treatment to end up with a criminal record so needlessly Mr. Speaker so I will ask the Premier if he will now agree to overhaul the mental health delivery system by calling a public inquiry. The Honourable Premier. Speaker, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, this is uh, uh, an issue that is affecting really all of our families and all of our communities across the province. Uh, I want to thank uh, the health care workers uh, across the province who are providing uh, that support. I want to thank the work that's happening uh, uh, in our public education system for early identification uh, and continue to work to, to put in, in place uh, uh, the proper supports uh, that uh, young uh, Nova Scotians, that families uh, uh, who, are, who are challenged uh, with these challenges for getting the support they require. Uh, and, and with uh, the multi-departmental approach uh, this government is taking, we will continue uh, to work with uh, families across this province to ensure those supports continue to be improved. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is one story, but it's a great example of where statistics and real life come together. We know that 200,000 Nova Scotians will face a mental illness at some point in their lives. In a province of our size, that is every family that will be affected. There are good things happening in our system. There are lots of professionals and volunteers that are working very hard. But even they tell us, Mr. Speaker, that the resources are not there, that there are cracks in the system, and that the system itself is in crisis and needs an overhaul. 
uh, asked the Premier, I've asked the Premier several times to add to the work that's being done by calling a full public inquiry. Will he reconsider his decision and report to this House that he will add a public inquiry to the efforts that he's listed that are already going on? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for his question. I want, to, I want to thank the Minister of Health for the work that he's doing in this department. I want to thank the uh, 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 staff in the Department of Health who continue to work, uh, Mr. Speaker, with our health care providers, with community organizations. Uh, to continue to build on the support sir, in this province. Uh, they continue to reach out to, to identify the cracks that the Honourable Member is referring to uh, and look for ways uh, with support out in the community that they can help ensure that when any family uh, in this province requires the support uh, of mental health uh, services for, for their children, uh, that they not only receive that, Mr. Speaker, but that the entire family unit receives the support that is required to help them over that period of time so that that young person then can go on and leave a full, active life. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last week the Premier stood on the floor of the House and praised the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education for removing the cap off university tuitions in our province. Then the Premier seemed to get angry when members on this side of the House pointed out just how high tuitions had spiked this past year. And maybe he should be angry, Mr. Speaker. Tuition fees in Nova Scotia are the third highest in Canada, and universities are signaling they expect the Premier and his minister to allow the MOU to raise costs for students even higher. So my question for the Premier is why is he allowing university tuitions to spiral out of control? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to thank uh, not only uh, our sons and daughters, but those tens of thousands of global citizens who come to this province every year uh, to go to post-secondary institutions, Mr. Speaker. They recognize the quality of our institutions here. Uh, they recognize the top, no top uh, notch education they're going to receive, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're continuing to find ways that those young people get an opportunity to stay here, continue to build the economy of Nova Scotia. And we're looking at ways, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that uh, not only are these institutions that are spread out across our province are providing that quality education, but they become economic drivers in the communities that they reside in. The Honorable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, as people come to our universities, our own young people can't afford to get into those universities, Mr. Speaker. This government is struggling to contain the fallout from its short-sighted decisions over the past two years. And yesterday, about 100 students forced the Board of Governors at NASCAD to delay further tuition hikes after the school had already experienced a 9% increase in tuition this year. Mr. Speaker, we know Cape Breton University is threatening layoffs even after the Premier allowed a 21% increase in their tuition. So, Mr. Speaker, when will this Premier take real steps to control ballooning tuition hikes in Nova Scotia's universities? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank again the Honourable Member for the question. I again want to remind her these institutions not only attract 20,000 people globally, our sons and daughters get an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, for the top quality education in this province. Uh, I want to uh, again uh, thank all those Nova Scotians who see the optimism in this province and not the pessimism that comes from the opposition, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank them for continuing to believe in this province and continuing to want to be here to work, get educated, Mr. Speaker, in this province. And they have a government that is going to continue to work with them to provide low-income Nova Scotians an opportunity to attend not only university but community college, ensuring that those, that, Mr. Speaker, in loan forgiveness, Mr. Speaker, ensuring, Mr. Speaker, that we do not charge interest on, on student loans that are provided to Nova Scotian students, Mr. Speaker. Those are all positive things going forward, and we'll do our part to work with young Nova Scotians to ensure that they get the quality education, Mr. Speaker, that they so deserve. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Well, there's a reason to be pessimistic, Mr. Speaker. The Ivany Commission could not have made it more clear that there's an urgent need for action. We have declining population. And this government, may I remind the Premier, cancelled the graduate retention rebate, $50 million out of the pockets of young graduates without reinvesting hardly any of that back into 
the university system. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier, why has he not reinvested the $50 million they took from young graduates to take the burden off the growing costs of university tuition? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. It gives me an opportunity to talk about our Graduate Opportunities Program, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, where we work with employers uh, to provide opportunities for those graduates, Mr. Speaker, that the Honourable Member is referring to. I want to thank the great work that's being done by the Apprenticeship Board, providing more opportunities for young people in this province, Mr. Speaker, to get an opportunity here at home after, Mr. Speaker, they complete their education. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the only pes pessimist in this province is sitting in the NDP, Mr. Speaker, because I'm going to tell you, young person after young person is looking for opportunity in this province, Mr. Speaker, and they are finally glad to have a government that is wanting to partner with them and provide them opportunities, not only to go to work for someone else in this province, Mr. Speaker, but to drive their own job opportunity and create their own job here in Nova Scotia, create a small business, Mr. Speaker, which that government is opposed to. The Honourable Member for Pitcrow East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Health. There are certainly uh, some doctors in the province that will properly try, uh, diagnose and treat Lyme disease, but there, are, but there are many that do not properly diagnose or treat <laughs> Lyme disease, either because they're not properly educated or they're fearful. So, when, uh, Mr. Speaker, when doctors' hands are, are tied or they're not properly educated, Nova Scotians suffer. And if we have Nova Scotians that aren't getting the proper diagnosis, uh, clinical diagnosis and treatment that they deserve, it's a concern to all Nova Scotians. So my question today uh, for the minister is, does the minister believe that there are doctors in the province that are not properly prepared or are afraid to properly diagnose Lyme disease? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what I can tell the member uh, opposite is that uh, we now have a very large contingent of doctors who have been uh, trained uh, to identify an early stage, uh, also in late and, uh, and post-treatment follow-up uh, across, across Nova Scotia. When I compare to uh, 10 years ago, uh, we have uh, moved the yardsticks remarkably forward. Doctors Nova Scotia, Dow Medical School, continue to do professional development for doctors around Lyme disease. The Honourable Member for Picto East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, more and more doctors being properly prepared is a good thing. And, uh, but we need, to, we need to keep pushing that yardstick further and further. So uh, my question today uh, for the minister is uh, we, have, we have a strong group of uh, advocates in this province, very well organized, very well educated, and uh, I think they could bring uh, good insight to the department. So my question is would the minister commit to a meeting with the group of advocates uh, now as soon as possible, and then setting up a system where the minister and the department meet annually with the Lyme disease advocacy group so that they're sharing information and the, making sure that the department is hearing what they have to say. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I have met uh, uh, with a number of people uh, who are in the uh, advocacy group uh, to improve service and uh, diagnostic uh, work uh, right across that uh, whole continuum. There are many aspects. Surveillance must continue, uh, obviously, to be to be done well. Uh, I have I have met, and I will continue to uh, meet uh, with people from this uh, group. Uh, I'm very sensitive to this issue. Uh, one of my first cases when I became an MLA uh, was a, was a little boy uh, from my community uh, who had Lyme disease, and I and I've tracked him over my time. In office and many many Nova Scotians have become much more aware of Lyme disease and we all know that the best place for all of us to uh, to do work is around prevention and make sure that we do our observation of, uh, of four ticks uh, when our children family members are outside. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the upcoming Paris Summit on Climate Change hopes to build on the momentum already underway. Leaders from here in Canada and around the world will have a chance to exchange ideas and discuss the challenges that lie ahead. On October the 23rd, CTV reported during a t uh, that during a teleconference call, 
Canada's premiers agreed that everyone not facing an election campaign would attend the, the uh, Paris summit with the Prime Minister, and I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. So I want to ask the Premier if he could tell us why he's chosen not to attend the Paris summit with the Prime Minister and other First Ministers from across Canada. The Honourable Premier. I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when the Paris uh, summit starts, uh, the uh, opening few days is for national governments. Uh, the Prime Minister will have a role, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we as provinces, uh, for the purposes of that summit, are considered sub-national governments. Our role takes place uh, later in December, December th 4th, 5th and 6th, uh, where uh, the Minister of Environment will be going representing the province, Mr. Speaker. I had an opportunity to sit down with uh, Canada's Prime Minister and uh, First Ministers to talk about this issue last week. Very clearly laid out the great work that has been happening in this province, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to ensuring that we reduce our carbon footprint. We're going to continue to do that. I asked the Prime Minister and uh, our fellow Premiers that uh, this issue, while it is a national issue and the federal government has a role in it, provinces who have already been doing great work over the last number of decades need to be, make sure we're credited for that and not penalized when it comes to any uh, public policy position that we, we make. And I'm going to continue, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that uh, Nova Scotia is represented on this issue. <clears throat> the Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the Premier for his response. And I, I would agree that a lot of good work has already gone on, Mr. Speaker, but I think we would all agree that the momentum needs to continue. Climate change is not something that's going to happen. It's something that's happening right now. And many, many people are feeling the impact and are concerned about it. So therefore, Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the Premier, during the First Minister's meeting, what were some of the ideas and concerns he shared with the Prime Minister with respect to what Nova Scotia is, will be doing to continue the momentum that's already underway. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, what I had told the Prime Minister and I told uh, other uh, Premiers across the country that we have a tremendous opportunity in Canada uh, because of our natural resources that we have, natural assets. Uh, I, I spoke to the Prime Minister about building a, a an electricity grid across this country that's connected from province to province to province that we can then be able to build on some of the hydroelectricity projects, Mr. Speaker, that are able to happen. For example, Newfoundland and Labrador has a Gull Island project which is bigger than Muskrat Falls that not only would it provide opportunities here in our region, Mr. Speaker, but I believe could help solve uh, some of the issues across the country. I've talked to the Prime Minister about investing in innovation because I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, if we don't harness the Bay of Fundy, our children will. We need to be able to have an opportunity to share that clean energy, Mr. Speaker, not only in our own region, be able to export some of that energy to provide opportunity. So at the same time, through innovation, Mr. Speaker, as we're driving down our carbon footprint, we're also providing good opportunities in this province. We just need help from the national government to recognize, Mr. Speaker, our power rates are reflecting the fact that Nova Scotians have already invested a substantial amount of money when it comes to changing climate change. We just need to make sure they're not penalized twice. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We now know that the Auditor General is going to look into the way this government hands out personal services contracts, saying he will take a preliminary look at how $5 million in government-issued contracts are being awarded. Mr. Speaker, the Minister responsible for the Public Service Commission says, and I quote, actually there are bigger fish to fry. Obviously he doesn't think this is worth taking a look at, but the Auditor General does, Mr. Speaker, so I'd like to ask the Premier, does he agree with the Minister of the Public Service Commission that the way the government hands out personal services contracts is so insignificant that it's not worth a look? The Honourable Premier. I think, Mr. Speaker, if he listened, uh, the Honourable Member of the Minister uh, actually said he looked forward to having uh, the AG review these, scrutinizing, Mr. Speaker. I want to remind the Honourable Member it's not only government, Mr. Speaker. He'll be looking at the one. He'll be looking at the ones his caucus his hands out, Mr. Speaker. He'll be looking at all the service contracts in in this pr province, Mr. Speaker. Unless the Honourable Member wants us to put everybody in the public service, we need to have employment contracts, Mr. Speaker, so that we can hire people to be able to do the work in this province. And the Auditor General will have a review it. Not only what this caucus does, but he'll review what that caucus is doing as well. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. 
Well, actually, Mr. Speaker, he did say that he thought there were bigger fish to fry. That's not our view. He's welcome to look at whatever he wants as far as we're concerned. But, Mr. Speaker, the concern that the Auditor General expressed in looking into public uh, serv personal services contracts comes from the record of this government where they handed out a uh, contract at Glenny Langell in the protocol office, previously a member of the public service, but no longer. Everyone knows now, Mr. Speaker, about the secret offer of a job to the wife of a Liberal MLA, Mr. Speaker, and on and on it goes. The Premier's own deputy minister, it turns out, is a private corporation instead of a person like everybody else, Mr. Speaker. So I'd like to ask the Premier, will he put an end to these backdoor job offers until the Auditor General concludes his investigation. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I again want to remind the Honourable Member that uh, there was no job offer made to anyone, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, any uh, members spouse in this House. I want to remind the Honourable Member he knows that. No matter how many times he repeats it, doesn't make it true, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to tell you what we're going to continue to do, Mr. Speaker, is being an open, transparent government and provide good government to the people of the province of Nova Scotia. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, and we welcome the Auditor General continue to do the great work that he's been doing on behalf of the citizens of this province and looking at not only uh, employment service contracts, Mr. Speaker, but looking at all the expenditures that government uh, do. And I'm looking forward to the fact that now he'll also look at the way the Leader of the Opposition spends the money on behalf of his caucus. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Premier can point his finger all, in all directions, but the reason the Auditor General is now looking at personal services contracts is because of the record of his government, Mr. Speaker. If they were truly going to be open and transparent, they would welcome the Auditor General's review without question instead of telling Nova Scotians that they believe that there are bigger fish to fry. Mr. Speaker, this is a very important issue, and I'll tell you why. The Auditor General says, so, and I quote, sometimes we audit things to provide assurance to legislatures and to all Nova Scotians and how things are working. Well, if this government is so open and transparent, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier just save us all the trouble and assure Nova Scotians now that his government will stop these secret backroom job offers and put in place real rules that protect taxpayers? The Honourable Premier. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for a question. This government, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've made available to anyone who wanted to look at all of the issues, anyone that we've hired, Mr. Speaker, the contracts, the contents of those contracts are made available to people, Mr. Speaker. It was when he was the Chief of Staff of a former government, Mr. Speaker, when secrecy was the code around here. Under this government, Mr. Speaker, we've been transparent. We'll continue to provide good government. And, Mr. Speaker, we'll go out, Mr. Speaker, and get the skills required to help us deliver good government to the people of Nova Scotia. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the fact is, we asked the Auditor General to look into these contracts to see how the government is handing out these jobs. Mr. Speaker, it was our request. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? The Auditor General doesn't always agree, but something caused him to agree in this case that the way this government is handing out personal services contracts or jobs is being done. Mr. Speaker, I have a list of those that are in place now. It total, it's over 100 people and over $5 million. Who knows what offers have been made that aren't on that list as of yet, Mr. Speaker. The Auditor General says it's important enough to take a look at how the government is handing out these contracts. Does the Premier agree with the Auditor General or not? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, we welcome the Auditor General to come and look at any aspect of the way government is being delivered to the citizens of the province of Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable, Mr. Speaker, the Minister has said that, but let me clear something up, Mr. Speaker. The list that the Honourable Member is referring to are just not people who were hired by the government, Mr. Speaker. There were people who were hired by the caucus of the Conservative Party of Nova Scotia, of the New Democratic Party of Nova Scotia. It's a practice, Mr. Speaker, that it has been used to hire political staff, Mr. Speaker, and people who do services that have skill sets that aren't necessarily in the public service that are there to deliver good government to the people of the province of Nova Scotia. And we've done it, Mr. Speaker, in an open, transparent way. And we welcome the Auditor General's review. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister in charge of the Film Incentive Fund. Last week, when I asked the Minister when he would lift the cap on the Film Incentive Fund, he stated the film industry, and I quote, publicly endorsed the Film and Television Production Incentive Fund. And I will table that. They haven't. They said it might be workable if the cap is lifted. 
I would like to table a Herald article about Annie Valentina. Her theatre company is leaving Nova Scotia. Film jobs offset Annie's income from theatre. Now most of those jobs are gone and so is she. Is there a message that the Minister would like to give to Annie and her family as they pack to leave Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question. Uh, the work that has uh, taken place between representatives of the film industry and uh, Department of Business has been exhaustive for the last number of months. And in those dialogues, representatives from the film industry have told government, have told my department, that the Film Television Production Incentive Fund is a funding formula that will work. And I want to table an article. Uh, Mr. Speaker, titled, Nova Scotia Film Industry Gives Up on Pushing Government to Reverse Tax Decision. Mark Allman is the, uh, is the chair of the board, and he quotes in the article, we're not looking to have the fund returned, we're trying to move forward, Mr. Speaker. That's what the industry has told us, that's what we continue to work towards, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, I, I find the language uh, from the Minister regrettable. He's indicated that, yes, and I think he's right, that people have given up in the film industry. Maybe we will have to present him with some going-away cards, because Annie Valina, it, Valentina isn't the only one leaving. The website Nova Scotia Film People Displaced.com tells many stories of people who are leaving or left their families for film jobs out west, and I will table that. Script supervisor uh, Zoe uh, Bizio, 33 years old, has moved to Toronto. Makeup artist and, and costumer Candace Nocton, 27 years old, has moved to Vancouver. Stunt woman Melissa Kelly. Does the member have a question? The question is, when will the minister lift the cap to ensure the first come, first served film incentive fund doesn't send more Nova Scotians packing? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I'm, I'm really surprised by the questions from the member. Uh, if she had engaged the industry and industry representatives, she would know where the industry is moving, where the industry is going. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I want to table another. I want to table another article from the Canadian Press, Mr. Speaker, from the Canadian Press on July the 19th, 2015. Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Business has the floor. The caption is titled, Film Producer Says Nova Scotia Incentives Are Workable for Industry. This is a prominent international producer, Mr. Speaker, who has said that the film, the t film Television Production Incentive Fund in Nova Scotia is workable. We continue to work with the industry, Mr. Mr. Speaker. We continue dialogue in a constructive, positive manner. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. On September the 12th, 2013, in the heat of the election campaign, the Premier, on behalf of the Liberal candidates, filled out an election questionnaire from the Pictou County Injured Workers Association. There were eight yes or no questions. The Premier answered yes to each statement, and I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. The Premier agreed with the statement the system needs to be reformed via Legislative Review Royal Commission, and the low level of benefits to workers needs to be addressed. Yet letters from the Premier and the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education say we are not prepared to bring forward legislative amendments and we do not expect to bring forward legislative amendments to the Workers' Compensation Act at this time. And I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Premier, why did the Premier say one thing to the injured workers before the election and the exact opposite after the election? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I'll ask the uh, Minister to respond. The Honourable Minister of Labour. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question, Mr. Speaker. We uh, continue to have dialogue, dialogue with the Injured Workers Association. The, the member will member, remember, in fact, that recently uh, we had uh, some issues with one of the Injured Workers Associations. We worked with them. Uh, they are now uh, funded, and they now uh, are operating again. So I want to assure the Honourable Member that we're willing to work with them, and that, in fact, we have bills before this House that deal with labour standards right now. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, promising something to get elected and not delivering breeds cynicism and hurts our democratic system. My question, did the Premier not mean it when his team filled out the Picto Injured Workers Questionnaire on his behalf 
or has he gone back on his commitment? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to thank uh, the Minister for the work that she's doing on behalf of Nova Scotia University. <laughs> Speaker, she's, uh, she's laid out, Mr. Speaker, work that's been happening uh, with uh, injured workers associations across the province. Uh, the Honourable Member has brought here, raised an issue around Pictou County Injured Workers Association. Uh, the Minister has assured them that if there's work to be done to work with, she'll work with them. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue, uh, we'll continue to move forward uh, to try to address the concerns, Mr. Speaker, uh, of uh, organizations across this province. Uh, and I want to tell you, Mr. Speaker, like all Nova Scotians, uh, any time somebody is hurt at work, uh, it's affecting uh, their health, uh, but also their livelihood and their ability to actually, uh, Mr. Speaker, continue to look after their family and provide the supports that, that they've been used to, Mr. Speaker. We feel as a government that we have a role to play and, and a responsibility to ensure that we do the best we can uh, for our workers across the province, and the Minister is committed to doing her part to work with them to find solutions. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Nova Scotia has over 3,000 fishers. We all know the importance of this industry to our provincial economy. I'm proud to say many of these fishers live in Pictou West. However, we are losing ground on collective efforts to coordinate a lobster marketing plan like other provinces, such as Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, and Newfoundland, for they are all supportive of the Canadian Lobster Council and are moving ahead of Nova Scotia with their mar marketing strategies. Will the Minister please tell us why he does not want to work with or support the Canadian Lobster Council like other provinces? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries. Uh, thank the Honourable Minister, a member, for her question. And indeed, uh, we have a great deal of difficulty in Nova Scotia supporting the Lobster Council of Canada. They have not been effectively uh, representing the whole industry in the province. And indeed, in southwest Nova Scotia, the majority of lobsters are caught. They have absolutely no support. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sorry to say that I think it's an unsatisfactory answer, and one that surely, though, our hardworking fishers will be disappointed in. Uh, they all don't live on the South Shore. As we all know in this chamber, implementation of the lobster marketing plan is dependent on funding from the lobster sector in the form of a levy. In August 2014, the Minister stated in a news article that he will present the results of the pilot project before expanding the levy. So, Mr. Speaker, it's 15 months later. Will the Minister please tell the House what the results are of this pilot project? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries. And indeed, this, uh, this project that's going on, and actually has been expanded to Southwest Nova this year, has been very successful. And indeed, we're seeing improved... Uh, quality results in the end marketplace and we have some fisheries that indeed one buyer that was working on this project in particular and several other ones as well as a local fisherman have seen a tremendous improvement in the quality and the price we're getting the lobster outside of Nova Scotia on the export market. It is truly working and indeed uh, we've seen huge gains in China in the market of lobster. We've gone from over 20... $23 million a year to over $130 million a year, which is a huge market. We can continue to grow. And I stress the biggest part of the lobster industry in all parts of Nova Scotia, very important where the harvesting is done in southwest Nova. The Lobster Council of Canada totally failed, totally failed in their process to try to get all the lobster harvesters in, in the province on side. And southwest Nova supplies 95% of all the lobsters that's export it live in this province. And if that organization isn't willing and not willing to work with the, with the lobster fishermen, the key lobster fishermen in this province, they don't deserve to be represented. Here, here. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. On Tuesday, I asked the Minister to provide the people of Nova Scotia with a comprehensive update on the VG flood that would include everything from the number of patients who have had their surgeries postponed to the results of the air quality testing that was ongoing. Yesterday, the Minister provided me with a short list, which I appreciate, uh, from the new health authority, which I'll table, Mr. Speaker, and it mentions the asbestos issue on the third floor from the ICU has been fixed and that drywall, drying, cleaning and polishing is ongoing. I wouldn't consider that an, a comprehensive list, Mr. Speaker. The people of the province deserve to know how the flood has affected patient care. So I'd like to ask the Minister. We know that the eye clinic centre on the second floor has been closed. Can the Minister 
can the Minister uh, of Health tell us, tell us uh, how many surgeries and appointments have been postponed? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and uh, I thank the member uh, for the for the question. Uh, we know that uh, the uh, the VG on uh, the Centennial sites are not only our provincial hospital, but also uh, regional work uh, takes place there. So it is uh, of concern that we uh, that that it got up and back up and running uh, very quickly. And in fact, uh, this provides me with an opportunity uh, to again uh, thank the staff uh, for the tremendous work that they did uh, at the time of the flood, since the flood, making accommodations uh, in areas that they never expected to have to work. And, uh, and what I will do is, uh, is provide uh, f uh, to the member opposite from the first day up until now uh, the numbers that, uh, that the health authority uh, does have available. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. We shouldn't have to pull it from the Minister. He said time and time again that he would be updating Nova Scotians about the impact on patient care that the flood had. And that's what all we're asking, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we know in question period, the Minister said we're not uh, being told other, or we're being told that other pieces of equipment are not covered under the insurance because of the flood. And, and uh, the Minister would say, uh, indicated that he would uh, get, us, uh, get us a list of uh, what that equipment is, uh, Mr. Speaker. In regards to my question the other day about the air quality testing, uh, that wasn't answered in the update, Mr. Speaker, and, and it wasn't answered with the Minister. Can the Minister at least today provide us with the result of the uh, post-flood air quality testing that has happened at the VG? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member uh, for, the, uh, for the question. Uh, we know that uh, 2A and 3A uh, have been cleared. Uh, the, the air testing now uh, is, uh, is of the quality that the medical teams will uh, reoccupy uh, those floors uh, on November 30th. Uh, in fact, uh, the fourth floor, uh, the air quality uh, due to moisture still in the drywall uh, is, not, uh, is not available for occupancy. Uh, this is an ongoing uh, process. Uh, uh, insurance costs and so forth are, uh, are yet to be determined. But really, this is in the hands now of the Provincial Health Authority uh, to, to make the decisions on, the, on what the final cost uh, will be, uh, the insurance uh, settlement. That's their purview, and we will hear from them in time. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question as well is to the Minister of Health. The consulting tender for the Dartmouth General Phase 1 was awarded to an out-of-province company that partnered with a local firm. The requirements in the RFP quickly made Nova Scotia-based companies ineligible as it required the company to have designed a minimum of five health care projects of over $20 million in the last seven years. This unfairly puts many reputable Nova Scotia firms out of the game unless they partner with a larger out-of-province company. So my question to the Minister is, how can Nova Scotia businesses survive if the government's very own requirements continues to favour out-of-province firms? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, not only in the health care sector, uh, but uh, right across uh, many uh, work areas, many professional areas, uh, we know that many Nova Scotian uh, companies are able to garner contracts right across the country and also uh, internationally. This is an area that works uh, both ways, and, and in this case here, uh, this was the most favorable, favorable decision that could be made uh, in the design of the Dartmouth General. The Honorable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we know that most firms in Nova Scotia haven't built uh, five uh, health care projects of over $20 million in the last five years. And it's, 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 a, it's a level of requirement that's way far above what any Nova Scotia company uh, can actually meet. A number of major government contracts in the health care system are coming up, as well as infrastructure planning and improvements for the VG Hospital and others. Uh, the Minister has alluded to uh, as a result of issues of some of the older facilities. Contract for those improvements represent a lot of work for Nova Scotians who need employment. So my question to the Minister is, will the Minister work with the Health Authority and Procurement Services to ensure that Nova Scotia companies are not automatically 
put out of the running. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I know that uh, we have uh, TIR who uh, uh, is providing uh, great uh, oversight uh, on the on these projects. Also, in terms uh, in terms of uh, uh, the contract, uh, the contracts that will be awarded, uh, they will all go through that uh, that kind of screening at uh, TIR, and uh, and I expect that uh, Nova Scotia companies will certainly be involved in all of those uh, health bills. The honourable member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, as our population ages, there's a greater, there's greater incidence of diabetes and there's a greater demand for renal dialysis. My question is to the Minister of Health. Uh, the Inverness Hospital right now is at full capacity. They offer dialysis, uh, but they only offer for three days a week. Uh, it's at capacity. The service could be expanded uh, so that people locally wouldn't have to travel two-plus hours to Sydney in many cases. Uh, and we know, Mr. Speaker, some people require dialysis three days a week. So it's a significant amount of travel. Um, if the minister was able to move funding from Sydney to Inverness, because the government is paying for the service there uh, as well, uh, that would help people locally. My question, will the minister help people who want dialysis closer to home in Inverness? The Honourable Minister of Health. Well, first, uh, first uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first of all, I, I thank the member uh, for the question. And uh, having been uh, in Inverness Hospital on Monday of this week, I want to uh, first uh, uh, let the House know and all Nova Scotians how pleased they are uh, to get a scanner to bring health service very close to home. Uh, while, I, while, I was, while I was there, uh, this, uh, this issue was, uh, was made very clear to me. Uh, as we are hearing across Nova Scotia uh, that uh, with our high rates of uh, diabetes uh, that uh, renal dialysis uh, is, is being challenged in many, many areas. And uh, so I have the background now uh, to take a look at this issue. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister for mentioning the CT scanner. I know uh, many people in the community <coughs> marched and rallied in, in sub-zero temperatures, so we're petitions that I tabled in the legislature here and certainly medical staff at the hospital who champion the cause and we thank them for uh, representing the concerns of people in the area and getting the CT scanner. Mr. Speaker, Inverness does have the equipment, as the Minister knows. The hospital only needs the funds to expand staff and I know that uh, that may require some months of training uh, but the government is already paying for the cost of the service in Sydney it just needs to move it to Inverness, where the demand is. Um, will the minister give us a date by which we could expect dialysis to be expanded in Inverness? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, maybe a final word on the scanner. I'm always pleased when we have uh, advocacy from, uh, from local residents, but I'm equally pleased when we have a Premier that kept his word to the good people of Inverness. And, and and, and in terms of the uh, dialysis, uh, it, is a, it is an issue. It's one that the uh, Provincial Health Authority, in fact, has already to, uh, to started to take a look at, and hopefully we'll have some uh, information for uh, the residents of Inverness uh, in the near future. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook. Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A document tabled by the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development lays out the expiry dates for P3 school contracts. This document states that the first decision notice must be given by the Minister November 30th, 2015, and concerns the fate of Sherwood Park in Sydney. And I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if this document is correct, then a decision is imminent. So could the Minister please tell this House today what her decision is with regards to the future of Sherwood Park. The Honourable Minister of Education. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for raising that question because I think it's important to note that originally there was a date of November 30th, 2015. The uh, private partner came to the uh, department. They have a number of other uh, P3 schools in our province that um, are maturing on 
in, uh, December, in uh, June of 2016. They asked if that date could be moved forward, so it would be putting all of their properties in line with the same date. We accepted their request. We approved their request, and so they will all be moving forward now as of the 2016 date. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that answer so that it's a little bit more clear. So that means that next year there are 31 more P3 schools to be provided by government to developers, the decision. So the government's plan for these schools will have a major impact, of course, on students, parents, teachers, and the taxpayers of Nova Scotia. So my question for the Minister is, does the Department plan to buy the these schools outright renegotiate the leases or walk away from the contracts after they expire? The Honourable Minister of Education. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. Uh, it is clear that at the end of the lease, the uh, government has three choices. Uh, they can purchase the building, they can renew a lease, or they can walk away. There's a lot of information that we are collecting now, collecting from school boards to help us determine which ones of the, of the P3 schools that we currently are using uh, are required to deliver public school program in the province. We recognize that the students in this province are our priority in this decision, and we need to know what the educational needs of those schools are in those communities. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we, we all deal with issues in our uh, constituency offices, and probably one of the most frustrating issues that I have dealt with over the last couple of years is dealing with the uh, Workers' Compensation Board. The, uh, the low level of benefits that some of them receive, if, if any, the, uh, the roadblocks that are uh, put in front of us when we try to uh, help injured workers and their families that are suffering. So my question to the Minister, will the Minister commit to reviewing the plight of so many injured workers that are struggling to receive what they deserve? The Honourable Minister of Labour. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, I will let him know that in addition to Workers' Compensation Board, there are a number of other uh, options available to injured workers, like the Office of the Worker Counselor, where they can get additional help. And I would urge the Honourable <coughs> Member, if he has any specific cases that he, he wants to bring to my attention, I'm, uh, I'm more than willing to listen. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, there's, there's many injured workers that, are, that find themselves uh, in this situation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, dealing with one right now that he was injured in 2004. Mr. Speaker, some of these workers, uh, I personally know them. I know where they worked. I, I know witnesses that were there when the injury occurred. They still uh, have their cases to, to reach a, any kind of a successful conclusion. The uh, caseworkers continue to shut doors on them. They put up roadblocks. They even ignore the findings of medical experts, Mr. Speaker. So my question is, does this sound like a fair process? The Honourable Minister of Labour. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. And again, I would urge him, if it's, he has any specific cases that he wishes me to take a look at, um, if he's concerned that there is a problem globally with Workers' Compensation Board, please uh, come and have a chat with me. I would more than, be more than happy to hear what he has to say. Uh, what I will say is that uh, we do have supports that are available to our injured workers. We want to make sure that, that our workers are safe on the job. And if they are injured on the job, Mr. Speaker, I want to make sure that we are doing what we, what we are supposed to do for them. And if, if they're having difficulty with that, there's the Office of the Worker Counselor, where they can take their cases, and 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 these are we actually pay for the pay for this service, Mr. Speaker. Uh, taxpayers do to to fight on behalf of the of the injured workers. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. When you're the Minister of Energy, style matters, and nothing defines style like the perfect coach. Maybe the Minister's EA thinks an old free coach from surplus looks, and I quote, great but the minister can spot a crime against design a mile away. 
So the verdict on that free coach was, and I quote, and I'll table it, a firm no. After all, how can a minister kick up his feet, lay back his head, and enjoy a moment of relaxation and reflection when the pattern on the coach is screaming, it's 1982. So my question for the Minister of Energy, given the wider range of colors and the 778 basic three-person coach comes in, which I'll table, why did he select a neutral gray over a more trendy citrus color? The Honorable Minister of Energy. It's, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's actually black. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Mr. Speaker, once the Minister selected the perfect coach, it was time to complete the room. A splash of fresh, clean paint, some new carpet, three frosted etched, window, etched windows, patches for privacy, a mounted television with HDMI loop. And voila, $6,100 later, the Minister's office was transformed into a mid-afternoon oasis. The minister may not think our energy supply can be renewable, but he understands that his soul is. So my question for the minister, at a time when all Nova Scotians are being asked to make do with less because of this Liberal government's cut, why was the Minister of Energy unwilling to scrimp on style? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the fact is that the furniture in the office, actually most of it was from surplus, a boardroom table, along with uh, seats, were very cognizant of any costs when renovations are Order, being Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions by members to ministers has expired. <clears throat> we'll now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Speaker, would you please call public bills for second reading? Now call public bills for second reading. Speaker, would you please call bill number 135, the Canada Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Resources Accord Implementation Act. We'll now call bill number 135, the Honourable Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I move that bill number 135 now be read a second time. I'm pleased to introduce amendments today to the Accord Act to extend the oil and gas moratorium on Georgia's bank until December 31st, 2022. Nova Scotians have been very clear about wanting the moratorium to remain in place. And with today's legislation, government will ensure this area remains protected for the long-term sustainability of our fishing industry. The moratorium on Georgia's bank has been debated on the floor of this legislature before. And I know, Mr. Speaker, that Honourable members on both sides of this House recognize the importance of Georgia's Bank to our fishery, to our provincial economy, and to the livelihood.